All right. <clears throat> I think we're ready to start. Welcome everyone to the uh, 2024 edition of the Soil and Nutrition Conference. We're very excited to have such an amazingly global audience here today. Um, I think we have over 100 people registered from Africa, over 40 from Ireland, as an example. So it's been really great to see the the real um, the presence of, from around the world showing up for this exciting and important conversation. So my name is Dan Kittredge. I'm the founder and executive director of the Biodetreat Food Association, and I'll be serving two roles today, um, both hosting myself and presenting. Um, in the subsequent weeks, I'll be the one doing the hosting and someone else will be presenting, but I thought it'd be best to frame the conversation um, <clears throat> with the historical work of the BFA um, as we sort of roll this roll this whole whole event out. Um, <clears throat> the, the theme of this year's conference is the state of nutrient density. And that's a term that uh, we helped to um, popularize in the sense of this carrot is different than that carrot. Nutrient density is a term that in uh, food science literature has been used for quite some time to say, um, you know, kale on average has these nutrients and rice on average has those nutrients. And so kale is more nutrient dense than rice. Um, but as a social movement, uh, that's a word that we've been using now for more than 15 years to discuss this kale versus that kale. Um, similar in the way that um, perhaps organic chemistry referred to things that had chemical compounds that contained carbon. And then there was a social movement that um, started using the word organic to talk about growing food in a way that did not involve synthetic materials. Um, what we have done with nutrient density is to create a social movement to discuss the variation in nutrient levels in food. And so <clears throat> we're really excited to be hosting this um, this event going on for the next 16 weeks to really dig deeply into that conversation. What's going on? Um, where's the science? What's been done? Where's the research? Uh, what are the best practices? What labels and certifications are coming up? What's the story with meters, um, et cetera? So lots of, lots of really exciting topics. Um, and presenters, I'm just so excited <laughs> every single week. It's going to be just brilliant. Um, um, really, really some, um, I don't even know, don't even know how, to, how to say how excited I am. So uh, really grateful for all the people who've, who've signed up and uh, chosen to sign up and those who are watching it afterwards. Um, um, probably you'll be, I think it was over 150,000 people we had last time uh, watched the conference afterwards. So um, look forward to this conversation. All right, so I'm going to start now with my slides and run through for the next hour or so the um, the history of the nutrient density from the perspective of the BFA, what research we've done, what the steps are we've taken, what we've found, um, where things stand with the meter, um, the definition of nutrient density with beef, et cetera. And then we'll open it up to our panel conversation. We've got Erwin and Adrian on today who are going to be speakers at the future um, Future speakers during this during this event, they'll be taking part in the panel. Other people will show up in other panels, and then we'll have a Q and A from the audience. Um, I would say people should be feeling very welcome to um, engage the chat functions. If you want to say hi um, in the chat box, you know this is who I am. This is where I'm from. Um, this is what I'm passionate about. What I'm excited about. Engage with each other there. But any questions you would like me or the other panelists to answer, uh, please put in the Q&A box. So everything in the Q&A box is for us to be engaging um, formally during the presentation and everything in the chat box is for you to <clears throat> be engaging with each other. So, all right, that all being said, um, Rachel, do you mind starting the slideshow? Great. Okay, so uh, we have here um, actually a, a the hedge the 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 uh, <laughs> the front page of our of our website, the Biodynamic Food Association website, which happens to be a drone shot of the farm I grew up on. For those who don't know anything about me, um, I grew up on an organic farm in Massachusetts, and uh, it was a homestead, mixed operation, CSA, animals, uh, fruit trees, etc. And uh, so. 
that's a part of the ethos. As far as I'm concerned, you know, we're thinking about smallholders everywhere um, from a planetary perspective um, and being empowered as part of this conversation. But to just for me, I have a, I have a strong personal impulse and this is just a graphic to, <clears throat> to uh, connote that, I suppose. All right, um, next slide. All right, so the BFA, uh, we were founded in 2010 and our mission is to increase quality in the food supply. Um, uh, I, as I grew up on an organic farm, was part of the organic farming movement to a, a, a large degree. My parents you know, worked for an organic farming organization. I was exposed to permaculture and and biodynamics and local food movement and Western Price and all the all sorts of different you know really good um, um, communities I would say in the sustainable ag um, world but didn't know of any organization focusing on the question of nutritional value. Um, there's a sort of a presumption in the organic world that you know our food is superior. There's a presumption in the biodynamic world that their food is superior. There's a presumption in the um, local world that their food is superior, but there's no real hard science to to um, to assess that. And my personal experience uh, as a farmer was that only when I was able to increase soil health was I able to get uh, plants to be pest and disease resistant <clears throat> and more flavorful and um, better shelf life and lower cost of production. And it seemed to me uh, after being exposed to bricks at the acres uh, acres USA conferences and all that insight that this is a really important conversation to be having. Um, what is the variation in food quality? And it's really about the nutritional value, not the label per se, where we should be focusing. So um, in 2010, we established this organization, Biodiversity Food Association, with a mission to focus on increasing the quality from a nutritional standpoint, flavor, aroma, uh, health-giving attribute, which we think connects to soil health and human health, um, farm viability, et cetera. Great, okay, next slide. <clears throat> All right, so we have here uh, a graphic which shows a number of the presenters we've had at conferences, at previous soil and nutrition conferences. Um, from a historical perspective, we started off giving workshops, uh, courses, um, established this conference in 2011 in partnership with Nova Massachusetts, uh, have set up local chapters, um, and and uh, sort of from, a, from a, a grassroots perspective, I would say word of mouth spreading around starting in New England, Northeast Quadrant of the United States, and then proceeding further and further around the country and, and then to other countries. Um, effectively, the foundational work was how to work with nature. The thesis is that um, when biological systems are functioning well, a corollary of that is increased nutritional level in food. And so um, the, the foundational work from 2010 through 2016 was really all about that. How do we do it? How do you, you know, how did plants evolve to grow? Um, uh, you know, what are the winning factors? How can we address them? Um, what are the cutting edge insights? What are tools you can use? Um, how do we integrate the soil food web perspective with the you know, mineral balancing perspective with the biodynamic perspective, all these different insights, you know, communities have insight and how can they be seen as part of a living system? <clears throat> because I think in some cases people will get dogmatic about, you know, I'm organic and therefore that must be better. And I can only do things that are sort of organic as opposed to we're all living here in life and how do we work most well with life? So the foundational work of the organization was, 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 was this um, educational work. But then, uh, next slide. Then we proceeded into the research side. Um, so as the, as the work of the organization was spreading around um, the country and then into other countries, uh, and we were talking about this concept of nutrient density, nutrient variation, um, meters, uh, being able to test, you know, possibly having, you know, market drivers be aligned with that. Um, we started to think about, okay, you know, it sure looks like regardless of where we're going and teaching these courses, it doesn't matter if it's north or south or hot or cold or 
sandy soil or clay soil or 2,000 acres of monoculture or, you know, a mixed <laughs> mixed garden bed um, didn't really seem to matter <clears throat> any external dynamic. It seemed like the more well the soil health was, the soil life was, the better the pest and disease resistance was in the plant, the better the flavor and the nutrients and the flavor in the crop, the better the shelf life, the better the farm viability. It seemed like this was applicable across the board. This idea of working in harmony with nature um, could, you know, build soil carbon, have very positive, you know, ecosystem health, environmental health impacts, um, could decrease cost of production for farmers, uh, increase farm viability, um, obviate the need for agrochemicals, uh, farmers, um, <clears throat> fertilizers and, and such, as well, um, increase flavor, increase shelf life, and we think increase human health. So, the concept was if it really is possible to dramatically um, improve all these things simultaneously, then that's the kind of thing that we maybe would want to be doing on scale and, and organizing around as a social movement. Because if we can heal human health and we can heal environmental health and we can create a dynamic where farm viability and sovereignty on land are much more plausible, um, we could be you know, envisioning many, many more, um, you know, positive outcomes <laughs> than I think a lot of people are, are, are looking at right now. There's a, I think there's a, a, a sense of um, <clears throat> existential dread in some, in some circles about climate and health and politics, et cetera. So the concept was, you know, how could we take these insights that seem to be potentially powerful and bring them to scale? And so, um, that work started in concept in 2016, but really in 2017, we started the work. Um, and we had three basic questions that we wanted to answer in the affirmative. You know, if we thought, if it, is it possible to use this nutrient density as a movement to, to really shift um, food and agriculture and human health? Um, if that was possible, you know, there'd be three things we would want to, ensure are true before determining that was a possible scenario. Um, the first question was effectively, what is the nutrient variation in food? Our hypothesis was that it was quite significant, um, that there was a, you know, um, <laughs> the reason this carrot tastes good and that carrot doesn't taste good is because there's a significant nutrient variation in there and that we're animals and that we've evolved this ability to discern with our noses and tongues. Um, um, so, a lot of the literature from the formal scientific um, institutes were, were not suggesting that was the case, where they were suggesting that perhaps the nutrient variation was fairly minimal, <clears throat> um, but what I thought was it was significant. So first question is, how dramatic is nutrient variation in food? Uh, second question, if nutrient variation is dramatic in food, what causes it? Is it connected to um, the variety of the plant? Is it connected to the soil type? <clears throat> is it connected to the um, to the uh, fertility program? Perhaps it's to the climate zone. Um, is it to uh, you know how close you were to <laughs> from from harvest to to shelf? Uh, what are the dynamics that correlate with increased nutrient levels? Our hypothesis was that it was soil health. A lot of um, <clears throat> others were proposing it was. It was really soil type is the dominant factor or variety of, 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 of the crop is the dominant factor or certification label or individual practice. Um, so do nutrients vary dramatically? A, if they do vary dramatically, do those variations connect to soil health or to things like soil type or variety or certification label? And then the third question, is it possible to build a handheld um, consumer priced instrument tool, scientific instrument, that could be used to assess that nutrient variation in real time with a flash of light. Um, because if it's true that nutrients vary dramatically, and it's true that that variation connects to soil health, and it's possible for people to be able to test that in real time, then our thought was the market could be used, the economic market could be used to incentivize the transitions that we're looking for, instead of trying to focus on um, um, 
you know, guilt tripping people or making them feel afraid or, you know, governmental policies or, um, you know, discounts or, you know, all kinds of other levers. So we could just use the actual open market um, because our thought was that people could flash a light at two bags of carrots on the shelf and flash light at one and it says 20 out of 100 and you flash light at the other and it says it's 80 out of 100 um, that people would likely take the 80 and leave the 20. So that was our hypothesis. And so we started this work in 2017. The first step was to build a first generation handheld meter um, that was done in 2017. The second step was to build uh, a, a lab. We did that, I built our first lab in 2018 in Michigan um, to begin testing nutrient variation in crops. So it was um, just about 10 different elements we looked at as well as um, antioxidants and polyphenols. We had people send in uh, carrots and spinach, just two crops that year from around the country, um, uh, from grocery stores, from farms, from farmers markets. Um, we just wanted to survey the state of the supply chain, like for where people have access to food to purchase, what's the nature of the nutrients in it? Um, and then in 2019, we built our, our second lab at Chico State in California. Uh, we were worked up to uh, six crops that year. Um, we added a couple fruits as long as well more um more more leaves um spinach and lettuce um we also had farmers send in <clears throat> uh the soil that their crops grew in so when they were pulling the carrots in triplicate to send into the lab we asked them to take the top 10 centimeters of soil and the next 10 centimeters of soil from underneath each one of those carrots to send into the lab so we could overlay soil metrics against the nutrient levels in the crops. And as well, we asked farmers to um, ask a, a long list of management questions. So, you know, did you till? If so, how deeply with what? What was the fertility program you used? What was the variety of seed? Where did you purchase it? Did you use cover crops? How did you integrate them? Um, just a whole bunch of questions like that. So we could begin to overlay the nutrient levels in the food against the soil metrics like organic matter and pH and respiration and mineral levels against management management questions because we really wanted to tease out what 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 patterns were there um, and with each one of those carrots or spinach or tomatoes or um, leeks that came into the lab we, or the soil we first flushed the light at it with the meter and then ran it to the lab so we could build a spectral data set overlaying the nutrient levels against this flash of light um, reading. Mm -hmm. So I think this slide we're seeing here is averages of the variation intensity we found. So with, um, you know, average out all those, all those different elements and nutrients, um, you can see this 5x, 6x, 4x, 8x, etc. cetera. Um, but let's go to the next slide here um, to show just a few more details. Great. So this is an example of the 2020 data year. Um, you can see the number of samples on the right, um, uh, almost 4,000 samples, all the different crops that were tested that year. Uh, on the top on the graphic, you can see the, actually those little green graphics are our farmers and the orange ones are citizen scientists. So people were sending in samples from across the US and Europe. Um, um, we had, I think over 200 farms in 2020, as an example. Um, um, we set up our first lab in Europe that year as well. Um, and moved up from from six crops to all these. So you can see here uh, on the on the bottom sort of left, you can see the food. So these are the nutrients that were being assessed in the food we were looking at: um, antioxidants, polyphenols, protein, the minerals, magnesium, sulfur, potassium, calcium, etc. Bricks. And on the soil there, at you know zero to ten centimeters or zero to four inches and four to eight, uh, we're looking at organic carbon, soil respiration, pH, and um, all those minerals. So. That gives you an outline of the things that we were looking at as part of this process. And now we'll move forward to the next slide and start looking at results. <clears throat> so I want to spend a couple minutes here on these results. They're they're quite quite powerful. I think this is really the the bulk of what I want to be talking about here today. In this presentation is what we found so far. Um, so on the left, um, with so you can see that left left graphic, 
Uh, on top, you see it says sulfur in carrot. So we're looking here um, just at one element and one crop. So this is the range of sulfur in the carrots we looked at. Um, I'm just seeing a question. It says, how do we ask questions? And the answer is in the Q&A box. So um, yeah, things that are in the Q&A box, I will see and be able to respond to. Um, <clears throat> okay, so um, we're looking at sulfur um, in this left graphic. Uh, on the on the sort of the, the vertical axis, you can see it says number of samples. So it's a zero and 20, 40, and then 60 is on top. Um, and then at the bottom, you see it says 8.41, 13.36, et cetera. And that says sulfur milligrams per 100 grams of fresh weight. So so if you look at that, that number on the bottom left corner, it says 8.41. Um, the carrot with the lowest level of sulfur we found had 8.41 milligrams of sulfur per 100 grams of fresh weight. And the, all the way over on the right, you see it says 33.19. That was the carrot we found with the highest level of sulfur. So from 8.4 to 33.19, um, if you do the sort of the math, divide you know <laughs> 33 by eight, you get about four, which means that that carrot over there on the right, those in the, in the dark green, there's only just one of them over there. Um, that had four times as much sulfur in it as the carrot on the left. Um, and okay, so that's one thing. This is a 4x, 4x variation. Um, then if you see the, 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 the bottom sort of, you know, graphic there, it says fifths of the range. Red is one, orange is two, uh, yellow is, is three. So the fifths of the range, that would be zero to 20 out of 100, 20 to 40, 40 to 60, 60 to 80, and 80 to 100. So, um, so you can see everything that's red in that graph, where there's a bunch of samples. I guess almost up to fifty there in the at the edge of it. That's in the between the the, the zero and twentieth percentile out of hundred. So if you got a fifteen on a final exam at college, you would be in the in the bottom twentieth percentile, right? Um, the next range is that the second range is from all the thirteen point three six to um the 18.32 that's the 20th to the 40th percentile so you can see the peak of the graph is right there at about the 20th percentile so out of 100 the most samples were present at 20 out of 100 so of all the samples we looked at for sulfur most of them had way less than what's possible does that, I think it's, uh, and then you can see, you know, you can see where the, where the yellow goes down over there. That's the 40th to the 60th percentile. So right there at that line in the middle of yellow, that's the 50th percentile. So you can see based on the, the bulk of the samples in that graph that the vast majority of all the carrots we sampled had less than 50% of what's possible, or at least of what we found was possible. Um, we. We, have, we didn't survey all the carrots in the world, so we probably didn't find the carrot with the highest level of sulfur in it. So that's how these graphs work. I know for some people, um, science-y things like this are not intuitive, so I like to walk, walk through it fairly slowly um, just to make sure that the basic points are being covered. Um, so on the, on, the, on the right, that was is phosphorus in carrots. Um, you can still see the same number of samples there, 0, 20, 40, 60 on the left. Um, if you see at the bottom, it's 11.7 milligrams per 100 grams. And <clears throat> at the bottom left, and then at the bottom right, it says 93.69. So you do the math out there, and that's about an 8x variation. So um, this is not small. This is not 2% or 8%. That's eight times. Like you'd have to eat eight of the carrots that have 11.7 to get as much phosphorus if you ate just one of those that are up on the far end. So uh, we're looking here at individual elements. Um, we looked at elements that we, we understood to be um, human health necessary, like we need these nutrients in our bodies to function, and that we understand are generally deficient in, in, in Americans at least, not, not necessarily people all around the world, but <clears throat> you can, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> understand something from that. So um, this is not nutrient density, this is not nutrient density, this is nutrient variation. We're just looking at 
what's the range of sulfur in carrots? What's the range of phosphorus? What's the range of various other things? Because their first question, remember, was what's the range of nutrient variation in food? So again, with this one in phosphorus, we can see um, that red, you know, is is goes up to pretty high, and the orange is where the peak is. The vast majority of the sample is in that twentieth to the fortieth percentile. Uh, the yellow starts high and then drops down. And again, by the time we get to fifty out of hundred, we've probably already eighty percent of the samples have been have been um, identified. That basically means that eighty. 85% of the sample of food that's available to people to eat um, is below the 50th percentile of what's possible. In this case, this is phosphorus. Um, but I'll say that we have slides like this for um, more than 20 different crops that we sampled um, across the North America and, and Europe over five years um, from hundreds of farms, um, different soil types, different varieties, different points of purchase, different certification labels. Um, and these graphs I'm showing you with carrots are, are remarkably similar across the board, regardless of which crop it is that we're looking at. So, all right, let's go to the next slide, Rachel. Okay, so here on the left with antioxidants, um, you can see that the lowest is 4.92 and the highest is 195. Um, if you do the math out, that's a 40x variation, 40, 40, like the carrot on the right has 40 times as many antioxidants as the carrot on the left. Um, so and antioxidants are, you know, anti-cancer, anti-diabetes, sort of, you know, those are the things in food that are <laughs> really good at causing chronic diseases either not to happen or to be reversed. So this is like much more complex nutrients than individual elements. Um, <clears throat> again, the peak of the graph is, you know, somewhere in the 15th to 20th percentile of what's possible. The vast majority of the samples are over there on the left at the low end of what's possible. There are some on the right side, but not many. Um, so this is just continuing to sort of emphasize across the board, this is what we're finding. Um, the final graph I've got here looking at nutrients, individual nutrients in a crop is polyphenols. Um, Again, polyphenols are one of those sort of complex health-giving compounds that correlates with flavor and aroma. Um, and you can see uh, from 2.34 to 49.75, that's uh, more than 20x variation. And the peak of the graph there is in the 10th percentile. So um, <laughs> uh, this is the nature of the supply chain that we found. Um, variation is quite dramatic. Um, and the vast majority of the variation that we can find is <clears throat> the best one of the supply of the supply chain is at the, at the bottom end. So high levels of nutrients are possible, but the vast majority of the foods that are available to us have relatively low levels. Um, this is effectively what we can conclude from these graphs and many others. Um, and recently we were uh, able to get some of this basic work uh, published in a um, journal called Nature Science Communications. So this is Peer reviewed at a you know fairly reputable level now, so it's not just a hypothesis. But <clears throat> not that getting published means you're a proven <laughs> laws, but at least it's a it's a good it's a good step forward in that conversation. All right, so let's now start to look at this. Was variation is variation significant? And we can say with some confidence, boy, it sure does look like it. So let's go next to the next slide and talk about where that variation comes from. Okay. So again, we're st sticking just with carrots. We've got many, many um, other crops where we have similar data, but we're just for this presentation, just focusing on one crop because that is enough to sufficiently make the point. On the left, um, you see um, box plots by variety. So um, sort of all those small words on the left, Napoli, Bolero, Nantes, Mokum, Romance, Yaya, yeah, yeah, Rouge Song, those are different varieties of carrot. Um, Again, we have the, the fifths of the range. So the, the red is zero to 20, the orange is 20 to 40, the yellow is 40 to 60, the light green is 60 to 80, and the dark green is 80 to 100. So um, we'll look at Napoli on top. You can see we have some, a number of the samples are in the zero to 20 range. Um, some are in the 20 to 40, some are in the 40 to 60, and some are in the 60 to 80. 
Um, Valero, again, we have some that they're you know quite, quite poor right down there at the bottom, um, but then some reaching almost to the to this to the 60th percentile. Uh, with Nantes, again, some in the negative in the in the, in the bottom 20 percentile, some in the top in the 60 to 80 range. Mokum, we have some in the bottom 20th percentile and some in the 80 to 100 range. So what, what I'm seeing here <clears throat> effectively is showing that you know some people are planting Napoli carrots and producing relatively high nutrient levels in those carrots. And some people are planting Napoli carrots and producing relatively low nutrient levels. Same thing with Bolero. Um, same thing with, so across the board, we actually did this, uh, one of our original research projects uh, as a partnership with, with Cornell and the Biodynamic Association um, here in North America in the US. And we had, um, we bought a pound of different <laughs> red cord chantonet, I think was one of the varieties seed and we sent that that seed you know from the same package to 10 different farms across the country um some were conventional farms some were by the name some were organic um and we were able to show again that nutrient variations were dramatic from the same seed source so what we're seeing here effectively is showing as far as i'm concerned that 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 variety is not a causal factor in nutritional outcome it, it may be a component but if you if you average out all the nutrients, the copper and the zinc and the phosphorus and the potassium and the polyphenols and antioxidants, which is what BQI stands for, is that sort of average. If you average out the nutrients, <clears throat> regardless of the variety, some are showing up well and some are showing up poorly. So that means it's not the variety that's correlating with nutrient variation. Um, <clears throat> the graphic here on the right, um, BQI squirts in carrot, box pots by, by climate region. This is looking at different soil types and, and climate zones. These are uh, United States Department of Agriculture um, uh, sort of blocks. So the Northeast, the East, North Central, Southeast, Central, these are all sort of defined by the United States Department of Agriculture. Um, as you can see, we got more samples from the Northeast than we did from um, <laughs> the West, for example. Um, we're based based here in New England and have sort of a longer track record of, of allyship and partnership. So that's just part of what happened. But you can see there's a lot of people in the Northeast in the red and just a couple in the dark green. You know, there's a bunch in the orange, there's a bunch in the yellow, there's a bunch in the light green. The It doesn't seem like being in the Northeast means you're doing a bad job or doing a good job. It just seems to show that some people are doing a good job and most people aren't doing that good of a job. East, North, Central, similar. Some people in the bottom 20th percentile, bottom 20th percent, some people in the top 20%. Southeast, <clears throat> again, significant range. Central, significant range. Northwest, significant range. You know, wherever we look, different climate zones, different soil types, it looks like some people are doing a good job and some people are not doing a good job. But there doesn't seem to be any connection between um, that soil type or climate zone and nutrient levels. Um, so <clears throat> again, the first couple questions we had, do nutrients vary dramatically? And what are the causal factors? You know, some people said it was soil type, some people said it was variety. Looks from this these these data that that soil type and variety are not correlating with nutrient variation. So okay, next next slide. <clears throat> All right, so um, on the left, uh, box plots by sample source. Uh, on top, we have farm. So those are from people who, um, you know, grew their own crops and, and sent them into the lab. Um, again, a lot of people in the bottom 20th percentile, but even more in the 20 to 40, um, uh, 40 to 60, 60 to 80, a couple in the 80 to 100. But, but just because you grew your own carrots didn't mean that you were growing good carrots. <laughs> um, the store is the next one. Um, and so this would be people who bought carrots off the grocery store shelf. Um, it looks like a fairly similar distribution to the farm, to the people who, who you know, grew them themselves and sent them in. Um, garden is the next one. This is people who grew carrots in their garden and sent in samples, right? Just because you grew carrots in your garden does not mean that they are nutritionally superior. What we see here is a bunch of those, well, not, some of them are in the bottom 20th percentile, a bunch in the 20 to 40 and 40 to 60, 
a couple in 60 to 80, but none in 80 to 100, right? Of people who were growing carrots in their garden. Um, and then and then on the bottom, we have farmer's market, people who sourced carrots from the farmer's market and sent them into the lab. To the lab. Uh, again, bottom 20, 20 to 40, 40 to 60. Like we're not seeing here that just because you bought carrots at a farmer's market means that you're getting superior nutrient levels in carrots. We're not seeing that because you bought carrots in the store, you're getting inferior nutrient levels in carrots, right? The point of purchase does not seem to be a correlating factor with nutrient levels um, here in carrots or other things. So this may be sort of um, <clears throat> uncomfortable or, or outside of the, um, the sort of simple talking points that are many many times used, but this does the data does seem to be showing up here. Um, you know, um, the, uh, so <laughs> I guess we'll talk more about it in the Q and A as we as we proceed forward. Um, the graph here on the right, um, box plots by practice. This might be one of the ones that's most difficult for people, um, depending on how they think about things. But um, right on top, you see certified organic. So those are all certified organic. You see, you know, a bunch of them in the bottom, you know, <laughs> peaking maybe at the 40th percentile, um, maybe maybe 30th, 35th percentile. Uh, the next one is people that, are, that use cover crops in the production of carrots, um, maybe peaking in the 40th percentile, but basically just because you're certified organic or just because you're using cover crops does not really seem to be swaying the the balance towards like superior quality um no-till is right there similarly there's many more in the bottom 20th percentile than there are the top 20th um the peaks around the 40th maybe you know or so people who use tillage is the next one <clears throat> remarkably similar range maybe a couple less excellent ones but but not a lot of variation there right what we're seeing primarily is the average carrot is not that good and any one of these things does not correlate with a differentiation. Um, organic is the next one. That would be organic and not certified. Those would be people who are, you know, smallholder farmers, backyard gardeners, um, you know, um, not showing superior quality. Reference and none are the next two. They really should be one. That's basically uh, carrots off the grocery store shelf that are not organic. And, you know, the peak actually of that reference one <clears throat> looks like it's into the 50th percentile or so. It's the fattest. <clears throat> where it's the fattest is higher than where the other ones are the fattest. And that means that would be sort of showing where the <laughs> where the average of, of grocery store non-organic carrots are. Um, and regenerative is the next one. Is it that one regenerative? N28, 28 samples. Bunch in the red, you know, number in the orange, some yellows, a couple light greens. Definitely no <laughs> dark greens. That's regenerative right there. At least people were self-identified. This is not certified regenerative. This is just people claiming regenerative. Uh, biodynamic is the next one. See biodynamic there with the you know few reds, some oranges, some yellows, a couple light greens, no dark greens. Um, uh, local is the next one. Um, pretty well dispersed from, from one end to the other. Um, <clears throat> greenhouse, light tillage, heavy tillage are the last three. So... What we're seeing here is just because you've got a certain certification label, <clears throat> just because you engage in certain individual practices, um, just because a crop was grown relatively close to you does not mean it's nutritionally superior. Um, this is uncomfortable for a lot of people, um, but what we're showing, dramatic nutrient variation, um, and we can't tie it to any one of these, like just because I'm organic, I'm got superior quality or because it's local or because it's regenerative. That's not what we're seeing the data. Um, the only thing that we did find, which I'm sorry, I don't have a graph graphic for you here is that did connect was levels of soil life. So the big, the big take home, <laughs> the big aha, which is not really an aha at all is that the level of life in the soil is the thing that most connects to nutrient levels in the food. Um, we tested that in these initial couple of years with simply a respiration test. So we we're, you know, seeing how much carbon dioxide is being emitted by the soil, basically how many microbes are breathing out CO2. Um, so very rudimentary test. Uh, 
But that's the only thing we found that connected. Level of life in the soil is what connects to nutrient levels. Less life in the soil, lower nutrient levels. More life in the soil, higher nutrient levels. And I think it's an important conversation to discuss <clears throat> how is it that some regenerative farms can have low levels of nutrients, low levels of life in their soil, or some organic farms can have low levels of life in their soil, or some non-organic farms, conventional farms can have high levels of life in their soil. Um, just because you sit in one kind of a box, like the non-organic box, does not mean you aren't a good farmer <clears throat> doing well with your land um, and, and producing relatively high quality food. So, um, all right, those are the basic you know, answers to the first two questions, uh, do nutrients vary dramatically and what causes it? Uh, this is the conclusion of many years of, of research. Um, I'm guessing a number of the people who are present today have been part of this, have sent in samples, have been part of this, part of this process. Thank you all for the work you've done as part of that. Um, and then now the next slide uh, will show the, the meter. Um, and, you know, is it, the third question was, is it possible to build a handheld meter at a consumer price point um, that can be used to test this nutrient variation. Do you want to show us the slide of the meter, Rachel? There we go. That's the, that's the slide of the, of the bionutrient meter. So this was released in 2021. Um, I think we made about 300 of them or so, and we were able to um, build calibrations for 10 of the 25 plus crops we assessed, where you could flash a light at the carrot or at the zucchini and get a reading back on your smartphone um, as sort of shown here in this graphic um, of where it stood um, in that continuum. So here we have an example of um, antioxidants and bricks. So again, this is not nutrient density, uh, sort of what is nutrient density? It's this, well, I guess that's what we're about to talk about next here, the next slide, but um, what all this work up until 2021 that we did was focusing on, um, you know, the variation of these individual nutrients and, and so we could tease out what the connections were. So we're not, this is not a meter that was released to say <clears throat> it can give you the nutrient density of a carrot. All it can do is give you the, where the antioxidants sit in the continuum, or if it's zucchini, where the polyphenols sit in the continuum. So is it possible to build a handheld consumer priced um, flash of light nutrient meter? That was our question in 2016. And by 2021, we had, you know, we're able to release this meter um, and show effectively, yes, this is entirely possible. So it's true that nutrients vary dramatically in food. It's true that that nutrient variation seems to connect to soil health more than it connects to anything else. And it's true that it's possible to build handheld consumer instruments that can be used at point of purchase to test nutrient levels. So that was those are the three questions we started off with in 2016. And um, we thought if we could answer all three of those questions, yes, then nutrient density could be a strategy that's used um, to revolutionize agriculture, to disrupt agriculture, to shift the way on large scale that we humans are engaging with land um, by developing an economic incentive structure, as in you make more money if you work well with the land than if you don't. And the concept here is, again, if a consumer can test nutrients with a flash of light, then the retailer can also do that. And then probably the wholesaler can do that. And then the buyer can do that and the packer can do it. Not that I'm saying we should have multiple <clears throat> you know, um, layers in the food supply. You know, I'm certainly in favor of short supply chains, but the reality is a lot of food does move through at least a couple different um, middle people between the farmer and the eater. And so if it's possible for the eater to do it, then we would presume it's possible for anybody else in the supply chain to do it. Um, so, you know, um, sticking the, <laughs> here's, we're gonna, we're gonna put a, put a flag out way over here at the edge. And understand that here's where we're starting, here's where we're going, and there's a bunch of steps in the middle, but we want to make sure that's a possible step over here at the edge. And um, <clears throat> so very excited to have been able to accomplish this and release this meter. Um, it rapidly became clear that even though 
we had been very explicit about the fact this was not a nutrient density testing meter. This was a proof of concept that was showing that it's possible to have a meter that can be used to flash lights and get readings. People still wanted it to be a nutrient density meter. People bought it and said, why can't I get a nutrient density reading on grapes? I'm like, well, <laughs> we actually don't even know what nutrient density is yet. There's, there's, there's the rub. So, um, so after, after proving all this, these, these th things out, um, we started in 2021 with the beef project and the beef project is designed to be the first crop that we use, that we define nutrient density in. So let's talk about that for the next 15 minutes of my presentation, and then we can open it up for, for Q and A and, and panel conversation. Um, so can you see the next slide, Rachel? Great. <clears throat> so. Um, again, like I said, this was launched in um, 2021. Um, actually, as the last event um, of our 2021 Soil and Nutrition Conference that went on for I think it was 32 weeks that that, that year. So <laughs> that was quite a quite a long quite a long um, quite a long set series. Wonderful, wonderful content. But the last event in the 2021. Um, soil Nutrition Conference in September was uh, a, a, a formal launching of this beef project. And um, here we are. It's been three years and now we're actually back with something to say and like we've gotten places and it looks like this whole conversation about nutrient density is much farther along. So we start off with the hypothesis. The hypothesis is that um, the more um, biodiverse an ecosystem that the um, cow has access to when it's um, alive, the higher the nutritional value of the meat that it produces um, and uh, milk, obviously, as well. Um, <clears throat> so you can see the graphic there. Um, polyculture, um, di diverse, diverse pasture, monoculture pasture, and feedlot. My hypothesis is the nutrient levels in the meat would would range in accordance with with that. Um, so next slide here, we'll show you um, sort of how this was designed. So this is a much more complex project. Um, we're looking at hundreds of different nutrients in the meat. So we're looking at uh, elements, we're looking at enzymes, we're looking at vitamins, we're looking at amino acids and um, fatty acids and lipids and proteins and uh, polyphenols and terpenoids. So we're looking at many hundreds of different compounds in the meat. Um, similarly with the manure, we're doing a, a microbiome assessment, looking at many hundreds of different nutrients in a sort of different species in the, in the manure, um, not just the diversity, but also the, the, um, magnitude, um, what sort of, what level at, are these species present in the manure, in the microbiome of the animal, um, sort of a, a you know, not massively sophisticated but a pretty 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 good uh forage assay looking at the forage assessing the nutrients and the species in the forage um looking at the soil that forage grew in wh whether it was whether it was grass or um or grain we want to look at the <clears throat> dynamics of the soil that was produced in um and then obviously questions about about how the the pasture was managed if it's pasture or what the mix of ingredients were in the feed the animal ate if it was grain mix um you know gender age uh variety you know stocking density moving rates sort of all these overlapping um um causal factors environmental conditions and then finally <clears throat> we have uh the um human health trials which is not formally what we've been publishing uh, or, or, or or funding, but Stefan, who's our partner at Utah State, uh, got some money from the USDA to do side-by-side -side, um, human health trials with the meat. So we'll take some of the meat from pastured animals and feed it to humans and see what happens to their inflammation markers in their urine and, and blood and feed, uh, you know, other people. Well, it's, you know, organized so everybody gets a chance to eat the grass-fed meat, the corn-fed meat, and then the Impossible Burger. So <clears throat> effectively, what we're doing is overlaying um, the biochemistry of the meat against the microbiome of the animal, against the environmental conditions of what it consumed, against the soil dynamics that that food grew in, overlaid against the 
environmental conditions of, of moving and stocking density and age overlaid against human health outcomes. So the concept here is that um, there's a point where cows that have this environmental condition where they eat have this level of microbiome, have this level of nutrients in their in their meat that have this level of effect, human health effect um, after eating it. And as we can, if we can tease that out, that would be our definition of nutrient density. So where we're at right now in this process um, <clears throat> is that we've got effectively all of the um, data collected. Um, it's from, you know, I guess we'll, we'll show you in a couple seconds here, the, 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 the other, other graphics where all the samples come from. Um, so the, the data has all been collected and it's now in a very sophisticated <laughs> data platform, which we'll be hearing about. Um, so all these people who've been part of this project are going to be, you know, speaking, speaking at this conference coming forward and really going into more detail about the steps and where we're at, but broad strokes. The data has been collected. Now we're engaging the process of trying to define nutrient density from that data. And so the strategy is uh, we're calling it the, um, the Bionutrient Definition Standards Board. Um, and we will be um, identifying microbiologists who understand how to look at different species and names and say, this is a healthy animal. That's got, that one's got gut dysbiosis. So we give, we give all the microbiome data to the microbiologists. Um, and ask them to rate which animals you think were healthy, which animals you think were not, and which animals sit in the middle. Um, and then we give the um, biochemistry data, <clears throat> the, the nutrient data to biochemists and say, tell us which one of these steaks looks like it was the most nutritious and the most imbalanced, which one had you know, high, high levels of omega-3s, which one had high levels of stress hormones and inflammation markers. Tell us which animals you think were most healthy and then, and then rate them. Similar with the agronomists, give them the forage and the, and the soil data and say, <clears throat> tell us which environmental conditions you think were most optimal for, for these animals. And then finally, to the human nutritionists, we give them the human health data and say, tell us, you know, which meat seem to have the most positive and the least positive effects on humans after eating it. Um, so our thought is, <clears throat> our hope is, our hypothesis is, that the biochemists are going to say this steak is the best and the microbiologists are going to say that gut flora looked great also and the agronomists will say this environment conditions were great and the um the nutritionists will say these human health outcomes were, were best and that's how we define nutrient density we define nutrient density by finding the place where all these things line up and then once we've once we've done the science to find that place then we can find what's called biomarkers and we can say, oh, it looks like the omega-6, omega-3 ratio is something that correlates with all these other things. So we don't need to build a really, really complicated, expensive handheld meter to test 250 different nutrients in a steak. We only need to build a meter that can test these five because these five at these levels and ratios correlates to 20 out of 100, 40 out of 100, 80 out of 100, et cetera. So... That's the strategy. That's the vision. We're at the point now of of you know bringing together those those scientists. So anybody who thinks they might know somebody um, <clears throat> or is qualified themselves that would like to be involved in this process, um, this is happening in real time. So feel free to reach out. But that's the design. All right, let's go. Uh, there's just a couple more slides, and I almost used up my my um, hour. So here we can see the location of farms. Um, we've got South America, we've got Australia, we've got um, the UK and Europe, we've got a lot across North America, um, Hawaii there. So we're looking at um, a, a broad suite of different environmental conditions, um, obviously primarily North America, the logistics of shipping meat and manure and soil across international boundaries, I can tell you, is remarkably <laughs> difficult. So we had hoped to have more samples from more parts of the world, but it was really, really complicated and difficult. Um, anyway, we got a lot of samples. All right, next, next slide. <clears throat> so um, just gonna couple more slides here and um, showing the preliminary data. This has not been published yet. This is this is just preliminary information we've got. Um, um, but as I said a bit earlier, omega-6, omega-3 is a, um, something that if you haven't heard much about omega-6, omega-3 yet. 
I promise you before this conference is over and even probably before <laughs> this month is over, um, you're going to know a lot more. Um, the, the short, the short um, conclusion is that a lot of the foods that are part of the um, sort of the modern Western diet have unhealthily high levels of omega-6 in them, um, <clears throat> which is something that is causal to a large degree in inflammation, which is causal in chronic disease. So um, whether it's cancer or heart disease or diabetes or uh, osteoporosis, um, those conditions uh, have as a foundation high levels of inflammation in the human body and um, high levels of omega-6 will be causal in that inflammation. Um, so there's a, there's a really nice connection here between excesses of omega-6 in our diet and increased levels of chronic disease in our populace. So, so this, this slide is all about omega-6 and omega-3 ratio. Um, and <clears throat> you can see on the left at the bottom, you know, it's, it's a, it's a grass fed side and we've, you know, broken this out in a, in a sort of a binary way um, to say grass fed, not grass fed, but obviously there's a continuum in there. Um, but so these are animals finished entirely on grass. The average was 1.7, 1 1.7 to 1 is the implication. So omega-6, omega-3 is 1.7 to 1. Um, and the range is from 0.9 to 1 to 11.4. Um, but you can see there's the, the vast majority of the samples are really like bunched in there below, below 2 to 1. It's like almost all of them are there. And there's a couple outliers that are sticking up way high. Um, we know from <clears throat> looking at this data afterwards and saying, huh, that's strange. There's like 150 samples that are all basically completely uniform and then 10 that aren't. What's going on with those 10? And in fact, uh, it was one of our partners who was um, part of a, a larger a larger company in the supply chain. And these this sampling was occurring during COVID um, and at a period when the, the grass-fed meat was... Um, this company was buying invested meat from Australia and there was a bunch of meat on a boat uh, off the coast of, uh, of LA that couldn't get in because there was too many other boats in the, in the dock. <clears throat> and so this company had to buy beef from a different distributor who claimed that meat was grass fed. Um, <clears throat> and because they hadn't worked that with that, that distributor in the past and they were curious, um, and they were part of this project, they sent in some of those steaks. And what we found is <laughs> they don't look like grass fed steaks. Uh, so we can, <clears throat> you know, whereas it comes to marketing and, and claims and, and communicating with consumers and things like that, um, <clears throat> people, I think, generally understand that there's a decent amount of um, reason to be skeptical, let's put it that way. Uh, from a technical standpoint, grass-fed beef, you can go to a, a restaurant and I've, I've certainly done this when I'm out on the road and you look at a, at a restaurant menu and, and they'll say grass-fed steak. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm pretty sure this cow did not spend its last six months eating only green things. It probably did eat grass at some point because almost all cows do eat grass at some point. So you can technically, legally say almost all beef is grass fed because at some point that cow did eat grass. It's like saying pasture finished, which as I understand it means that the cow did not spend its final months in a confined animal feeding operation. Pasture finished, however, does not mean that that cow only ate grass at the end of its life because you can dump grain onto the ground in the pasture and still be technically pasture finished. And in that case does happen in many cases. So, um, we have to be, you know, skeptical or, 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 you know, <laughs> um, pay close attention to these claims, which is part of the opportunity of nutrient density is to get right through all the claims, right through the labels, right through all the marketing to be able to, with a flash of light, say, does this have, you know, what I think it should have that would make it healthy? What our data says is, is good or not. And that's really the opportunity here. Um, so what we see here is that the, um, the grass fed beef. Uh, was averaging at 1.7 to 1. Um, I think it's 
Anything below 2.5 to 1 is considered to be good. Um, anything above 4 to 1 is considered to be bad. Uh, so, so we have here on the on the right side, you can see the grain-fed samples and those dots. Um, there's a significant range from 3.5 to 1 to 14.5 to 1. Um, and, you know, just because a cow ate some grain at the end of its life does not mean it ate only grain. Um, and so, yeah, we can see there is dramatic variation here. Uh, I think, but, but it is the American Heart Association that tells us that anything above four to one is is not good for you. American Heart Association, they're not a like a radical revolutionary organization. But if you can see the range on the bottom right, you can see from three point five to fourteen point five. American Heart Association says anything more than four to one is bad for you. It looks like <clears throat> almost all of the grain finished steak does not pass that test. Um, we're going to be having a, a presenter next week, Ken Hamilton, who's going to be talking a lot more about this and how to, you know, work really well with, with cows to help them finish rapidly. And, um, he's also going to be talking about pork and chicken. Um, and this is something that's blown my mind. You know, if you understand that um, the grain generally has high levels of omega-6, um, and <clears throat> I grew up on a farm where we raised pigs and raised chickens, meat birds and layers, and we fed them grain every day and they ate a lot of grain. And even though they were out on pasture, the vast majority of their diet was grain. And <laughs> most chicken, organic or not, most eggs are not organic or not, most pork, you know, pasture raised or not, has very high levels of omega-6, omega-3, uh, even worse than this grain-fed beef. So that's going to be a big topic for our conversation next week. I put it ahead of the whole rest of the broader agenda because I think it's so important. And anybody who's a farmer who's raising um, pigs and chickens this year, you need to hear this uh, because not only can your cost of production dramatically decrease, but your nutritional impacts can be dramatically improved. So that's just a bit of a, um, a teaser for next week's presentation. But what we see here, just to you know, finish this topic of the, of the beef project is that there's a dramatic um, variation in nutrient levels. Uh, we're using this uh, omega-6, omega-3 um, as a stand-in for our definition of nutrient density. It sure does look like the animals that are finished on uh, on pasture have dramatically improved levels of those nutrients. Um, and uh, yeah, let's just go to the next slide. And I think there's only maybe one or two more left. Um, all right. So again, yep. What are we finding? It looks like the diversity of the pasture, the number of plants that that cow has access to eat directly connects to the omega-6, omega-3 ratio. Um, so you can see it there. Higher plant diversity results in a better omega-6-3 profile with diminishing returns after 10 different species. So if you're raising cows and their pasture has more than 10 species in it, they're probably going to be just as good as people who have pastures with, with only 10 species in it. Um, what's really exciting here is it doesn't really seem to matter if those species are perennials or annuals or um, native plants. It's really about the biodiversity. And so what that tells us is it doesn't matter where you are in the world, you can do a good job producing high quality beef. Um, so I think that's a very exciting um, exciting outcome. All right. I think, is there one more slide, Rachel, or is that it? No, that's it. Great. Okay. <clears throat> and I'm only three minutes past time. Okay. So great. Um, Erwin and Adrian, who are going to be speakers uh, coming up, are on the, have showed up to be on the part of the panel this, this week. So do um, you guys want to turn your cameras and, and um, mute? I think Erwin, you're still muted. Adrian's unmuted. Let's let's just talk for a couple minutes, Hi, the three of us, and um, see if you guys have any comments or 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 questions. And then it looks like we got a whole bunch of questions in the Q and A. And let's make sure we make sure we can address those. But let's let's hear you guys' comments or thoughts first. Yeah, first of all, thanks so much, Dan, for this very wonderful presentation. Again, it continues to blow my mind, uh, especially when you talk about the carrots. I'm a carrot grower with uh, five kids who are my own bio-nutrient beaters. <laughs> I know when I have a good carrot or I have a bad carrot. 
And uh, this is very interesting for me. Um, I am wondering, my first question, is the real food campaign still active or is it closed? So the real food campaign was the name that we used um, when we were beginning all this research work in 2016. Um, and we uh, effectively just changed the name and called it the Biodetrate Institute um, maybe three years ago. So um, because we're actually doing some pretty serious legitimate science and real food campaign sounds nice, but it doesn't it doesn't sound quite as serious as the work we're doing. So it was basically it was rebranded and um, all of our research is up on biodutrientinstitute.org is our website for all of our science. That's a really important point. Biodutrient.org is our is our main homepage, but biodutrientinstitute.org is where you can see the reports from all the stuff I was I was showing in the past. Yeah. Okay. So and if people still want to send in samples and contribute to the database, is that possible? Aha. Uh -huh. Very good question. <laughs> because you, you you yourself are sending in samples and wanting to participate <laughs> and participating. How does that work? Yeah, exactly. Um so the initial yeah, it's hard. <laughs> What there is, well, <laughs> um, people don't necessarily know that you are in this process, but, but that's, a, that's, that's a good, it's an important question for everyone involved. Um, so the initial work that I said we started in 2017 with the variation, um, and we had our first lab in Michigan, and then the next one in California, and the next one in France, and now there's one in Scotland as well. Um, we focused on that originally because we had some serious questions, you know, what is the nature of variation. Does it connect to soil health? Is it possible to build a meter? And by 2021, once we had answered those questions in the affirmative, then our priority shifted to what is nutrient density? So all the money we were raising and you know effort we were putting towards those basic variation questions, um, we reprioritized now towards <clears throat> asking the question, what is nutrient density? And that's a that's a crop by crop process. So instead of surveying a bunch of things and sort of saying, I wanna see what my zinc level is or my phosphorus level is in relation to other, other producers, we're saying, what is nutrient density in beef, in wheat, in carrots? And so that's a process that has taken us, I think it's pretty close to a million dollars in the beef, um, in beef so far, we hope um, and we think likely we'll be able to do it for dramatically less than that with, with future crops. So wheat is the next crop we're hoping to be focusing on. And we're hoping we can do it at the range of about a quarter million dollars, um, be able to sort of be able to have a categorical red, yellow, green, 80, 40, 20 out of 100 definition um, in wheat for, for a quarter million. But um, for people who still want to engage in the old database, um, <clears throat> which is all still up there online and, and the data explorer is there and you can you know get samples in. Uh, we have one lab in Scotland, which is taking samples, and one lab in at Chico State in California taking samples. Um, we're not supporting that process particularly. If you want to go and <laughs> contact them and and pay them directly and 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 you know get your samples, and then we'll help make sure those samples the results get into the database. But um, we're not we're not supporting that in the way we were historically because it's no longer the priority. Um, We've proven to our confidence that nutrient variation is massive. And once you, like, we're not the farmer wanting to see where their carrots are. We're the organization wanting to say, <clears throat> can we define this whole thing broadly? So hope that's clear. Yeah, that's clear. But for me as a farmer, I want to know if different management practices result in higher, um, higher values, so to say. And I think it is uh, important if you show the, the bar graphs that show this big variation. As a farmer, you want to know which practices do you need to do to work the best with the principles of the biological systems. And I think it's not just the variation that is important, but how do you how do you score higher as a farmer? What do you, what can you do better? And and of course, farmers have a lot of ideas and they do a lot of tests. And if they send in crops from different tests or different management practices, for instance, working with rock dust or with different cover crop mixtures and so on, then they can get a better feel if they're going in the right direction. Because, you know, the overall uh, variation is that big that you just cannot say it's only cover crops, it's only rock dust and so on. And you need to know if your specific management uh, combination is working. 
I, as a farmer myself, I am completely um, sympathetic to exactly what you're saying. I would say um, until further notice, a refractometer is a really good instrument to use to test overall system function. Um, obviously, you know, the tongue is the best. Like you said, your, your children are your your binding chip meters. And I will completely agree that God or science or nature or universe, whatever you want to call it, engineered some very sophisticated <laughs> nutrient monitoring devices. We're all hardwired with one. But if you want a meter with a number, yeah. if you want to get a, a, a number on a, on a scale, I think the refractometer is still the best tool we've got. And it doesn't cost anything once you bought it to use it over and over again. So um, yeah, if you want to get the level of phosphorus, the level of sulfur, our labs are still there. They're totally available. Um, it sure looks to us like nutrient density is a much more complex construct of all these different compounds. It's not just copper or sulfur. And so um, sometimes people focus on, it's got this much vitamin D, therefore it must be good. And it, without looking at the whole biochemical matrix and um yeah i mean these are the these are the questions we're struggling with but um sorry sorry i don't have a better answer ideally in short order and i think i mean i don't think i've sent out an email about john kemp yet and what he's about to tell us at this conference about what he's got for in field meters I'm like there's a bunch of bombs that are going to get dropped in the next 15 weeks i promise you about like <clears throat> where the state of the movement is and what is coming down the pike. And yeah, I mean, there's <laughs> John Kempf is one of our speakers who I don't think has been formally announced, at least with a newsletter or anything. And he is working on some in-field meters that can be used in real time to test nutrients in plants and microbes too. Um, so in-field microbiome assessment. I know that may be of interest to you, Adrian. You're being polite and quiet, but um, <laughs> yeah, I listen really. really. <laughs> What's that? <clears throat> yeah, it's very interesting. I uh, had the same questions in mind about um, the taste, because I think it's the most important, especially for small market gardeners, to yeah. really produce tasty food. In the opposite, I I was in contact with a big retailer in Switzerland, and we we wanted to to sell them tasty tomatoes, and they told us they cannot sell tasty tomatoes in summer from Switzerland, and then in winter sell the not tasty tomatoes from Spain. The consumers gonna be angry if they have only one part of the season good tomatoes. So the goal of the big retailer is to all the time have not tasty tomatoes <laughs> so in some ways sometimes retailers have a really twisted mind in the wrong direction but what i also wonder is like about shelf life if you made connections about nutrient density and longer shelf life because that is what we hear often of regenerative farmers here that really their shelf life of the the winter vegetables is much longer and this gives them a really economical um, advantage to many, many other farmers. I think this is also an important topic. Absolutely. I think, I mean, so everything we understand so far is that shelf life increases as nutrients complexity and increases, uh, which correlates with flavor, which correlates with bricks. Um, <clears throat> we did not formally test that with our... Uh, our trials with these vegetables, that was not, we just had to prioritize what things we're focusing on and that was not one of them. Um, but all the circumstantial evidence that we have suggests absolutely that um, there's a direct increase in mm -hmm. flavor and shelf life. Oh, those things correlate directly with nutrient levels. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah. Good. Sometimes I see, um, I'm in a region where we have a lot of pig farmers and the nice thing is that I feed perfect food to the pigs with a lot of zinc, with a lot of iron, with a lot of um, uh, other uh, micronutrients. And sometimes in the leaf saps, I have perfect results in all those micronutrients, but also like 10 times too much nitrate inside. So in, in, in some ways it's nutrient dense, but in the other hand, there are so many nitrates inside, it must be bad. So how you deal with 
those effects. <laughs> well, I think like the question is, food. <laughs> what is what is nutrient density? I mean, the question is, what is nutrient density? And even, is that the right word? Um, <clears throat> you know, the hypothesis is that when you have a plant that is healthy, that is doing well, there are certain levels and ratios of nutrients in it um, that can be understood and we can build meters from that and we can, you know, test it at some point on the road. Um, and so high levels of not good things is <laughs> not a balanced, uh, not a balanced system. And so, so it's not just more is better. It's not just more of everything is better because, um, you know, more inflammation in the beef is not good. More omega-6 in the beef is not good. More stress hormones in the beef is not good. Um, it's looking at all these different things and levels and ratios and saying, um, <clears throat> I mean, I take some responsibility for having chosen this term nutrient density to be used to discuss this topic because there wasn't one when I was starting this conversation out 15, 17 years ago. And I said, we need one. And I started using it. And I don't know anybody else who was actually doing that back then. So I, I, I think I'm probably significantly responsible for the fact that we are using this word and it's not necessarily the best word. I, at some point a, a while ago, I stopped using it for a number of years. I stopped using the word nutrient density because I thought it was the wrong word, but it was too late because the cat was already out of the bag. And that was the word people were using to refer to this concept. But there is a lot of, a lot of misunderstanding and, and sort of lax use of the term. So that's why we're hoping to really focus on an empirical definition and get it into some sort of a framework that has science behind it. So it can't be so readily perverted and twisted and turned sideways like organic has, at least here in the States. And it seems like regenerative is on the verge of being also perverted um, by some of these bigger entities. So um, we're calling it the Bionutrient Definition Standards Board. We're not calling it the Nutrient Density Standards Board. Um, we're still trying to not use the word nutrient density because <laughs> it already means something to food scientists. And um, if we just create our own word and, and define it um, directly, maybe that'll, maybe that'll um, simplify this definition process. But yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah I really like the work on, on the grass-fed beef. I'm, I also, also have grass-fed beef on my farm. And some of those animals go to the Alps. I'm going to also show on my presentation a picture um, how those fields on the Alps look like. And they, oh. their, their diversity of herbs is like sometimes you have fields of 30 different herbs. And when you drink the milk of those cows on the Alps or have the cheese, it's just amazing of the flavor. I never found anywhere else in the world cheese or milk with such a taste. It's a, a huge difference to the milk in the valley where they fed a lot of corn and, and soybeans. So yeah, I really agree with this also just with the taste that what yeah. diversity really helps and um, for the outcome of the quality of by the by the beef industry. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Uh, I I try to convince our organization to send some samples over of <laughs> grass fed beef from the Alps. <laughs> Well, it's too late. We're we're already done sampling, so uh, oh, okay. <laughs> we're not not taking in any more any more beef samples. We've we've collected everything we want to collect, and now yeah. now once you've collected the data, then you actually have to process the data and digest it, and yeah. and you know, but your papers and everything else. So it's already taken long enough, um, and we've got enough samples. But and hopefully we'll have a definition of nutrient density at the end of this, which means that you can test your beef much less expensively. Because it yeah, was a twenty five hundred dollar project for farmers that were sending in samples as part of this process, and you know we want to get it down to a, you know maybe it's a one thousand dollar machine to start with, but you once you have the machine, you can flash lights all day long and get readings. Um, <clears throat> so um, maybe it'll be the price points will lower over time. They will lower over time with with scale, but it looks like you know with the omega-6, omega-3 being a stand-in for nutrient density and what's technologically possible to build, um, you know, being able to make claims on, you know, to build meters, to make claims on PAC is all, again, part of what we're talking about over the next 15 weeks is what are the logistics of bringing this forward into the market and, and, and uh, yeah. <clears throat>
And did you check the also on different uh, cattle varieties? Because once we had a study in Switzerland, they they saw like the, the Highlanders, they eat up to three times more different herbs than a more intensive milk cow, like a Holstein cow or something. Um, is there also a difference between the varieties? Um, it's, well, I think if you provide a Holstein access only to the Swiss pasture what will they eat yeah i think if you if you if you give them a choice maybe different ones will prefer this or that but yeah it sure looks like certain varieties are selected to do well in different environments so similarly with carrots and beets some have been selected or bred to do well in a, in a chemically fertilized environment a lot of the hybrids for example um and when a lot of the heirloom open pollinated varieties are you know, have the inherent capacity to do much more well in a in a living living soil ecosystem. So, um, yeah, yeah, great, cool. Uh, how far is the technology of the meter um, in being implemented into a smartphone? Um, it's only requires a smartphone company to say they want to do it. <laughs> and did they already knock on your door yet? No, 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 no. I think. Why? Well, because we haven't done a good enough job telling the world about what we're doing, I guess. <laughs> Maybe part, the, of the, part of the objective. Watch, yeah. <laughs> What's that? The Apple Watch is fully on health, so it would be a device to add on the watch. There's know. a lot of a lot of these. No, no, the wearable wearables is exactly a real thing. And yeah. there's one way to come at it, which is, I think when I've been traveling in the UK, there's this thing called Zoe. There's a Zoe app and people are, it's. I think it's, it's associated with a wearable and what they eat and People can monitor, I think, their manure also, their their, their poop. Um, but, you know, you really are able to get feedback loops like I ate this and then this spiked and that means I should not eat that again. And so we, it is a is a real thing that's happening is, is you know, the technology is there for people to be able to, it's flashing a light, you know, through your skin at your blood and it's reading things out of your blood and it can give you feedback about, you know, don't do that again or, you know, that was a good thing. Um, so <clears throat> technology is right there. The issue I've keep, I've been saying forever is we, until we have a definition for nutrient density, you can't build a meter to test it. You have to define it first and then you can test it. So I have no doubt that, that the technology will come along. Um, my, you know, focus has been on working to make sure that that technology is calibrated to honest and appropriate readings. So. Do you think it would not be enough to start with just more or less? If you scan two tomatoes, then the one has more polyphenols than the other, and you can make a choice, right? Um, if if somebody wants to build a polyphenol meter, go for it. I want to build a. I want to. I want to define nutrient density. I, I want to. I want to solve this problem systemically and and create a dynamic where we have the capacity to to support complete market transformation and i think if it was just polyphenol or just antioxidants people can try to trick and and yeah <clears throat> like the pasture fed that they feed grain in the pasture <laughs> i know so red lettuce course. has more polyphenols than than green lettuce so just have yeah. some red lettuce. so i mean breed for red for those red varieties and you'll get that but you won't get the the complete you know nutritional profile so um i think if we as long as we focus on just one nutrient or another without understanding that it's, you know, the, the complete relationship, we're going to be missing the point. Um, yeah. Uh, I have a farmer's question. Sure. And this is also my last question. Um, is there a um, contradictory between a high yield and a high nutrient current content of one acre or one hectare? Is there a dilution effect, so to say? I don't think so. No. I think the dilution effect comes when you start adding fertilizer. My experience as a farmer is healthy plants are remarkably productive and you do not get a decrease in, um, you, you don't have to have a decrease in yield to have an increase in nutrients. I think that's a, it's a, it's a, it's a red herring. Um, I've experienced that numerous times on my farm where the healthier my plants get, the more productive they become. Um, and certainly you can jack them up with fertilizer and cause large yields to happen with synthetic nutrients, but nature actually has capacity to do a really good job as well. So, <clears throat> so I think we that's, that's, that's really promising for a farmer, right? 
Well, the whole point is if your cost of production goes down, right? Because you don't need the fertilizer, because you have a well-functioning microbiome, because you've got good epigenetics, um, your yield goes up. You don't have pest and disease pressure because you've got healthy plants because they're biochemically indigestible to the insects and disease. Then you don't have the, the fertilizer bill. You don't have the insecticide bill. You don't have the herbicide bill, the fungicide bill. Your yield goes up. Your cost of production goes down. Economic viability is increased. Soil health is increased because you've got a functioning, you know, ecological pathway um, where carbon's being cycled through the soil. Um, you got better flavor. You get so children are more likely to be eating carrots than not eating carrots. Um, then the children are healthier. Then you have lower pharmaceutical bills and medical bills. Um, the opportunity here is quite exciting. Um, that's that's the whole point. Yeah, not just for the farmer. Their behavior well. will be better also. And when you have different balanced meal, you don't flip out quite so easily. Exactly. You maintain your community more well. Um, no, that's true. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, um, this is great. I think, I mean, I see a bunch of questions in the q and It looks like there's more than 30 there. So um, um, I'm just going to start working, working through the list, but feel free to Feel free to pipe in too. I want to make sure we we engage we engage everybody who's in attendance and not just keep it this small group. Um, uh, Susanna Zelinska, um, question regarding nutrient testing: Do you test the same varieties against each other? Um, perhaps that came in a bit early. Um, <clears throat> we were not doing randomized replicated trials, um, sort of control controlling everything but one factor. Um, but we did get people going the same variety. In different environmental conditions, so I think we, I think that was that was shown in the, in the slides. Um, okay, um, and um, Natasha, do you overlay this data on the amount of nutrient that's ideal for people? In other words, is more sulfur better? Perhaps that was another question um, that was a, early in the presentation um, that said, uh, you know, we addressed. Um, nutrients that we, we were looking at nutrients that were directly um, understood to be deficient in the average American's body. So um, uh, I hope that answers it to some extent. Um, Dirk says, is high better? Can food be too dense? I think Adrian perhaps um, was, was bringing that up as well. Um, <clears throat> what can happen is things get a very strong and intense flavor. Um, and some people don't like a strong and intense flavor. Um, we think about bitters, medicinal plants, medicinal plants have very strong flavors. So um, yeah, um, it's a balance of course, but it's, I don't think it can be detrimental. The fact is you may get all of your nutritional needs met from us consuming a small amount of food, um, which is not a bad thing, right? Um, it's about the calories being empty or not being empty. Um, if your calories are have a few calories and a lot of nutrients, then you've got then you then you you need to consume fewer calories. And so again, one of the corollaries of this whole premise is that um, we don't need as much food as we're eating because we're because if the food we're eating has more nutrients in it, our bodies are looking for nutrients, not necessarily just calories. So okay. Um, Henry asks, what percent was from commercial sources? Um, I think you saw those graphs at the end there, which showed the, you know, the from stores and the and the um the non-organic. So I would say probably 30%, maybe 40% was from commercial sources. So a very significant um percentile was was not was not the the small, you know, integrated organic regenerative biological producers. <clears throat> Um, Rod, can you touch on sample preparation methods, sampling variability with respect to ripeness, et cetera, and overall capability of labs to process and conduct these tests? Yeah, sure. Um, the, the only real metric we had was that you were getting it at a point of purchase. So we were, we were surveying what people have access to, um, and, so sometimes people have access to something that was picked 
raw and gas to turn pink in the form of a, you know, like a tomato. And sometimes we'll have people have access to something that was picked ripe. And so the fact that the industrial supply chain in many cases involves picking things before they're ripe to get them to travel all the way to the shelf would mean that some of those things in the industrial supply chain are inherently less nutritious because of the nature of the industrial supply chain, which on principle would mean that the shorter supply chain, um, more local things picked ripe and picked recently is going to have a much, um, it's going to have a, a, um, an advantage in the fresh fruit and vegetable community. Uh, another interesting point there is if you are eating frozen blueberries as opposed to fresh blueberries and those frozen blueberries were picked ripe and then frozen right away at the peak of the nutritional complexity versus the other blueberries that might have been picked a little bit early so they could not rot um, and then they were sitting breaking down for two weeks those more expensive fresh blueberries that you're eating out of season probably will have lower levels of nutrients than the frozen ones in that are cheaper in the in the in that aisle of the store so um <clears throat> when we try to think about the implications of all this um there are some there are some very um uh yeah, just curious, curious connections that occur. Um, okay, Susanna, another question. Um, since compounds such as antioxidants are usually destroyed with heat treatment, does this mean this food has to be eaten raw? Um, well, that's a good question. I don't know that I can speak exactly to that. Um, as I understand it, things like antioxidants do get broken down in your digestive path before those components are taken in, you know, through to the microbes through your gut and and re and rebuilt. So I, I I'm not a specialist in nutrition. I can't speak directly, but um, as I understand it, the ten pieces of antioxidant, if they're all still there, that it got broken into because it got cooked, are still going to be nutritionally valuable for you. Um, so I don't think it means necessarily that cooking is a bad thing. If you are steaming broccoli and a lot of the nutrients end up being in the water and you dump the water out and you've taken some of the water out in that fashion, perhaps. But again, I'm not the one to speak to that. And I don't think either Adrian or Urban probably is either. Feel free to pipe in guys if you are, if you know. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Jim says, um, why do you insist on making the words and numbers on the graph so small? Um, because we have not prioritized our communications efforts, Jim, because we've been focusing on the science and um, it's been a historical issue in the organization um, that we have not um, created aesthetic presentations so much as we've been just trying to get the work done. So definitely an own goal on that one, but um, always, always room for improvement. <clears throat> um, Claire, has there been any research done on these nutrients and fertilizer use management? I'm not sure. Um, I think, I mean, in general, the the, the understanding is that uh, plants have evolved to eat through symbiotic relationship with microbes and that when uh, you add fertilizer, which is soluble nutrients into an ecosystem that short circuits that pathway, it may cause the plant to grow large or fast, but it does not cause that plant to grow well. So um, I think the general the general answer is the 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 more the fertilizer the more that fertilizer is used, the 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 less uh, sophistication and complexity in the biochemistry you're going to have. It's really the microbes that are building those those preliminary compounds that are put into the form of antioxidants and terpenoids and phenolics. And when you don't have a well functioning uh, soil microbiome, you, um, yeah, you just can't get those, those high quality nutrients into the plant. <clears throat> um, okay. Claire, uh, does Dan's lab link in with the other labs, e.g. example, soil biology testing labs, like soil food web one in origin, in Oregon, what was the reason for using sulfur as a nutrient for testing? Um, there are a million different ways of 
testing anything in different kinds of labs. Um, our focus when we designed this initial project was to um, be able to assess many, many hundreds and thousands of samples at a very low price point. And we wanted to assess, we want to be looking at a number of different factors. So um, we want to be looking at the management practices, we're looking at, the, at all kinds of different soil metrics, all kinds of diff different nutrients. And so um, <clears throat> the soil food web, you know, is focuses specifically on, on the, on the, on the biological component and historically has been fairly expensive in the sort of two, $300 price point. We were getting all of our nutrients in the crops, all the soil metrics, all the management data for less than that two or $300 price point. So the, the primary concern um, has been efficient use of capital. We want to maximize the sp spread of data we've collected. And because everything is being done with charitable donations, um, um, we don't have a surfeit of capital. So, so um, I think webbing in soil food web insights and perspectives in all kinds of other aspects, I'm, I'm extremely excited about. Obviously, with the beef project, we we moved to starting to look at at many hundreds of different species. Um, I don't think soil food web is such a empirical. Um, framework where it gets down to genera and and family and species. Um, <clears throat> it's more of a, a visual visual analysis framework, which is great uh, if you've got a microscope. But for publishing data, um, if you had a bunch of different people looking at mic microscopes and getting um, their readings, that would not be so readily um, publishable. So hasn't been something we've 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 um, prioritized. Capital being a primary reason, but the um, replicability um, is another one. Okay. Um, Geraldine says BQI carrots um, box plot in boxes for biodynamics is a is a surprisingly dis surprising disappointment compared to certified organic. Just a comment. Um, yeah, um, I don't know what to tell you. A regenerative didn't look too good either. Um, um, local didn't look too good either. Uh, a lot of these things are are unfortunate. I mean, the reality is <clears throat> getting certified and doing a good job are two different things. A lot of people do a good job and don't get certified. Some people get certified and don't do a good job. And in most cases, the certification labels we have out there are not connected to quality. They're connected to individual practices. Um, so, okay. Um, Sherry, what keeps BFA from capturing flavor experiences alongside of nutrient data collection? Sherry has, of course, um, asking the flavor question. Um, we did actually capture um, flavor data, not on all the samples, but a, many of the samples. Um, I think it was just like a, a one to five was this like a pleasant, desirable, or really repugnant? Um, but that is part of the metadata that we have collected, Sherry. Um, uh, but that was just the people in the lab took a bite of the carrot before they, you know, after they flashed the light at it, before they <laughs> ground it all up and tested it for nutrients. Um, so yeah, another one of those things that is extremely important. Um, and in future, as we continue to do this work, we'd love to be integrating into the process. Um, I know, I think Stone Barnes is doing a lot of work on that in the beef. I was just talking to our local chapter in, in New York recently, and and I know um, <clears throat> some places are focusing a lot on the on the on the flavor component. Um, some places are focusing a lot on the nutrient component. Ideally, we should be working together. Um, it's a big movement, and that's again part of what we're trying to accomplish here in this presentation series going for the next sixteen weeks is webbing together that movement and helping people who are allies find each other, self-organize, coordinate, and 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 um and work together. Okay. Um anonymous attendee, is this data available on the web? I'd love to see the data on additional crops. It is on the bionutrientinstitute.org site. Um, yeah. Okay. Sue, um, we don't have any data from Africa. How can we help collect the data from these import for these important data bases as citizen scientists in Africa? 
Right. So, um, and thank you, Sue, for helping to bring so many African farmers to this um, course. Really, really appreciate your efforts in that regard. Um, effectively, the logistics of shipping um, fresh fruits and vegetables, A, you know, in between countries, but B, in between continents is, is, a, is a logistical nightmare. And so um, the real requirement is to be able to have a lab in close proximity that you can send your samples to. Um, we had had some off and on conversations with a researcher in um, South Africa who was looking to get a lab set up. Um, that has not occurred. Um, there's logistics, there's money, there's, you know, like who's paying for it, who's running it, who's managing it. So this could be done anywhere. Anybody who wants to implement this in their local bioregion should feel, you know, totally free to, and we will support you with all of the IP and like the how-to and everything else. As far as paying for the money to, to do it, that's no longer a priority for the BFA because we're, we're moving on to the nutrient density definition process. Um, so the the sort of uh, less expensive broad strokes assessment that we did where I showed you most of those graphs. Um, <clears throat> as I said, we currently have a lab in um, Scotland and one in California that are running the protocols. Uh, but yeah, we, we certainly have tried to have one in Africa and on other, other continents. Um, so um, it's like all things, somebody's got to want it. They got to have the money to pull it off and then the bandwidth and energy to pull it off as well. Um, but ideally, the vision is that we're getting to the point where we have meters that can do this in real time. We don't need to send things off to a lab. And beyond the tongue, the best meter that's out there, which is really inexpensive, which costs $20, you have to buy it once. It has no battery. You can use it over and over again. It's called a refractometer. The BRICS refractometer is an absolutely wonderful tool for baselining um, where you stand in the supply chain. Um, our presenter in two weeks, um, Mark, um, from the Netherlands is going to be talking about sort of game theory and strategy for a movement. How do we, how do we presume to organize a systemic movement around nutrient density? And um, our thought is that the um, use of the refractometer is a way we can really um, do that. We can have local people in all parts of the world testing their supply chains with refractometer. It's quite simple. You just squish the crop, get a drop of juice out of it. And you can look at it through the meter and get a and get a reading. It's a very very simple, very inexpensive um, technique, and so that is on the agenda, as a lot of things are uh, for this next next fifteen weeks. Right. Um, okay. Um, Susanna, lots of questions here. In terms of superior quality, how do you look at also the chemicals that should not be present in the food? As endocrine disruptive chemicals deriving from pesticides, which supposedly organic produce should provide. Um, <clears throat> so it sure looks like the um, level of life in the soil, you know, cannot be high, or the life anywhere in the plant cannot be high in the presence of these toxic chemicals. Um, and so um, <clears throat> one of the corollaries of, of, crops that are of high quality is um, that they can't have these toxins in them because you can't get high quality crops without having a well-functioning microbiome. So it's kind of a circular circular thing. You can you can have toxins in the environment. So say, you know, some organic farms, they're certified organic now, they might not have been applying toxins in the last three years, synthetic, synthetic toxins, um, but there may be residual toxins in the soil in the last 30 years of, of previously non-organic production. So, um, you know, that's why we're focusing on nutrition because just because you didn't apply toxins doesn't mean they're not present. But if you get high levels of nutrition, it sure looks like it's almost impossible to do that and have toxins present also. Um, so, um, and so we haven't looked at those. We haven't looked at toxins. We've only looked at positive at, you know, pro-nutrient compounds, at least historically uh, for that basic reason. Okay, um, Derek, is there a handheld nutrient content testing EG on site? And if there are, what are the parameters tested? Um, 
I think maybe that was the best thing you could use would be the refractometer um, as far as we've gotten so far. The whole idea is that in five years, um, this has all been done and nutrient meters are present like smartphones are present. That there is an industry which has been established, which is building them. In fact, maybe they are in your smartphone. Um, but the fact is we haven't gotten to that point yet. So so uh, that's why we're having this conversation. That's why we're trying to build this global movement is to raise awareness around the opportunity and to raise the money to do the research so that we can build the meters. Um, so right now, the tongue is the best, but that's not empirical. The refractometer is the best um, that is empirical. Yes, Elizabeth, zero to 32, Brick's refractometer, exactly. Okay. Um, <clears throat> um, Riza? Now the question is, what are the practices that are correlating with higher life activity in the soil? Very, very good question, Riza. It's not per se about the individual practice. It's about when that practice is done. And and um, this is, I mean, Adrian and, and, and Irwin are gonna be talking to a great degree about this, as well as John Kempf and, and David Knaus. Um, so we've got full sessions on this topic of how do you create a dynamic where the you know microbiology is flourishing. Um, it's not about tillage or not tillage. It's not about cover crops or not cover crops. It's about strategic tillage with appropriate cover crops. It's a, it's a it's a delicate dance. It's a delicate dance, and and that's why I'm so happy to have Adrian and and Erwin here um, <laughs> because that's exactly what they're going to be talking about. Like there and you know there's some really wonderful work that's being done there in Europe, which a lot of the Americans aren't necessarily aware of. It's been happening in non-English languages that is really starting to dial this in in a brilliant way. And, you know, I think regenerative fits an example of a of a, a buzzword that's been building over the past five years or so is oftentimes simplistically correlated with thou shalt not till, thou shalt use cover crops, et cetera. Um, thou shalt have animals involved. And you can engage all those practices and still not have healthy soil life. It's not about the cow, it's the how, right? It's not about whether you're using cover crops, it's about what cover crops you're using and when and, and how you're managing them. So I think this is a really important nuance that um, some of the people who are trying to focus on certification labels that are process-based, not results-based, are missing out on. Um, Okay. Um, do you want to respond quickly to that, Erwin, or is that enough for now? And <laughs> I, I would like to respond to the previous question or two before that about the chemicals and organic produce or yeah. no chemicals and organic produce because uh, we are a bionemic um, a producer and we have had the privilege of having uh, be part of a research project two years ago um, which focused on our potatoes, on conventional potatoes and on civilians in the villages surrounding our and conventional potato fields and they checked the dust from our house they checked our fields they checked our potatoes the leaf and the tubers and they checked our urine um, blood and stool samples and surprisingly in the dust in our house which is surrounded by all our organic fields and about 500 meters wide there is uh, uh, all conventional um, farmers there was uh, about 200 different compounds uh, being found in very high numbers, which uh, can come from agriculture, but also can come from clothing or uh, paints or whatever, even though we try to use a uh, uh, nature-based uh, building. But the thing was that uh, besides from very persistent chemicals in, my, in the soil that for 25 years ago, before we went organic, are still there, like the DDT and other things that don't break down, those were not found in the potato tuber nor in the leaf. And you can say that the potato leaf is vulnerable to all the same chemicals that get in the house dust, um, but it does not get in the leaf and does not get in the tuber. And also our own um, bodily fluids, so to say, were only, uh, we had only four um, substances found only in our urine, me and my wife. And um, the average of the organic farmers was 10 and the average of the uh, conventional farmers was 20. So it, it was very surprising that there is so much chemicals all around 
hands in our house does, but the, the optimizing result is that a good biological system, be it our own body, be it a healthy soil, can clearly produce um, um, a chemical, almost free um, a produce, so to say. So that was very uh, yeah, optimizing result. Yeah, so, so there's conventional farms all around you, spraying yeah. lots of chemicals, and those chemicals are getting over your fields and into your house, and they're found in your house. Yeah. But the ones that are landing on your fields somehow are not present on your plants, I would argue, because of the function of microbiology. Because when you have yeah. microbiology functioning well, part of what they do is digest toxins. It's one of their foundational functions is to create a harmonious environment. And so it sure looks like the more well the bottom of the food chain is doing, the more well the whole system is doing. And <clears throat> think about the bottom of the food chain. Like if the animals are at the top of the food chain and plants are in the middle of the food chain and the plants are the, and the microbes are at the bottom, then we should be focusing on the bottom because you can't have a big top without a <laughs> strong bottom, right? And it's, it's a, yeah. I'm, I'm a little bit sensitive to time and, and these questions keep coming in. We got 24 questions in nine minutes. I keep answering questions and a new one comes in, new one comes in. So I'm going to go a little bit fast and see if we can end on time and address everyone's questions. But th thank you for that wonderful sort of <laughs> lived lived the answer to that question. Um, Saju says, what is the impact of fruit coatings on these instruments? Um, um, we'd have to just look at what coding it is and probably we could figure out, you could read read that and sort of cancel it out. I haven't gotten there yet. Um, but, and how about a, a thin layer of plastic over something? How would we read through that? There's ways of dealing with these things, um, which is a little, a couple steps ahead of where we are, but I think they're totally doable. Um, um, so in the soil studies, I noticed you did not measure soil microbial diversity. Is there a reason why? I think I already answered that. The initial process was because it was too expensive. Um, we certainly wanted to. And I think going forward, as we do the nutrient density definition work, microbial diversity is going to be completely foundational. I think that's going to be absolutely showing up as a key, key corollary, uh, which is a question of, of cost. Um, um, <clears throat> um, uh, what is the test we use to measure soil life activity, uh, RISA? Um, we used respiration. So we basically uh, took dried the soil out, um, added a certain amount of soil to a certain amount of water, put a lid on it, and measured the CO2 after 12 hours and 24 hours. Very, very simple. <clears throat> um, Susanna, you said that everything depends on the soil's health, but practices that are connected to better soil health as no-till or cover crops do not equal higher nutrient density how can soil health then be achieved? I think I already addressed that. It's not the cow, it's the how. Just because you cover crop does not mean you had air in the soil and air is critical for microbes to function or it does not mean you necessarily had water in the soil. So it's about balancing the whole ecosystem. Um, and uh, yeah, certain practices are correlated, but they're not necessarily, but it's about, it's about the result, not about the theory. I, I think I made that point. Um, Chris Berman. Chris is the guy from South Africa who was working to set up the lab for anybody in Africa who is interested. Um, he's connected to universities down there and has tried to set up a local chapter and um, has been looking for more allies. So um, Chris's question, nutrient variation slides refer, the dark green is what we would like to go to, I think. Um, <clears throat> question one, conventional science could argue that dark green represents outliers. How would you respond, Dan? Is the dark green an outlier or plausible at scale? Question two, how do we move the red, orange, yellow, light green to dark green at scale? Question three, is there a definitive direction to move from the red to dark green or is it seriously context dependent? I live in a hot, dry, Southern African place, so context is relevant. Many thanks for the presentation. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> what we were looking for was the outliers, Chris, because the point is, if it's possible, that it's possible. <laughs> and, um, you know, we've got examples of lots of people around the world who are not necessarily operating on scale who have shown that a brilliant can be accomplished. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I think 
a lot of science will, you know, scientists, which I'm not, we can define terms, will remove outliers to find the average. That's the exact opposite of what we're trying to trying to do. We're trying to see what's the potential. So we can say, this is the lowest we found, this is the highest we found, and we put everything honestly on a scale in between and say, most things are at the 20th percentile of what they could be. Um, it's not all like all carrots are uniform. Some carrots are more nutritious, some are less nutritious. Um, how do we move red, orange, yellow, light green to dark green at scale? Um, again, Erwin, Adrian, and various others are going to be talking about that during this during this uh, next fifteen weeks. So I'll leave I'll leave that to their very um, knowledgeable hands. Is there a definitive direction, or is it seriously context dependent? It's seriously context dependent. Um, you have to have a living system, um, and different times of the year, different climate dynamics, it needs different things, and that's really the issue is. Um, being a good steward, being a good caretaker involves um, being present <laughs> to the nuances, like raising children. I use the example sometimes. Um, okay. Um, Muritu, is it possible for you to start a farm in Kenya? What were the cholesterol levels of in the grass fed meat? I'm not sure we've looked at cholesterol, and I'm not sure cholesterol is a bad thing either. Um, there's a, a really wonderful book called The Big Fat Surprise, um, which is a great in, uh, investigative journalist's um, look into what we think is good fat and bad fat and why animal products have gotten a bad name. Um, the Big Fat Surprise is a great, great book if you want a, a more um, <clears throat> holistic perspective on that topic. Uh, is it possible for us, BF, BFA, to start a farm in Kenya? Uh, I, theoretically, I would say we like to work with farmers wherever they are and um, support them with our understandings and our courses and everything else. Um, so we do have online courses of, uh, recorded, freely available on our YouTube channel. And I actually have been planning to travel um, to Africa. I probably will in the next few months. So we could talk about doing things in person there as well. Um, all right. Um, Henry asks, was soil organic matter ever rated? Yes, we looked at organic matter and it did not connect. You can put down lots of compost, which has a very high level of organic matter and not have sufficient minerals or other things present. So organic matter does not connect to nutrient density per se. Um, if it's well built by nature, then it totally can, but there's ways of getting um, unnaturally high levels that do not correlate. Um, was soil life defined? No, um, we just we just looked at respiration. Can you use a refractometer on beef? I have not tried. I know you can use it on milk. I don't think I don't think for meat refractometers work. Um, could we please introduce the panelists? What do they do and where do they come from? Sorry, Adrian and Irwin, I did not introduce you. <laughs> do you want to say quickly where you are from and what you do, or wait till you're uh, <clears throat> on stage? Yeah, we're definitely going to interview. Oh, that's okay. Also for the presentation. You first, Adrian. Yeah. <laughs> Just George, I'm Adrian. I'm a farmer and entrepreneur from Switzerland. Our company is focusing on uh, compost tea machines and ferments. And also um, we do a lot of leaf step analysis. And I run a little family farm with uh, cows and some cropping and uh, hazelnuts. And yeah, like this, I'm... Um, quite uh, holistic and do a bit of everything. Yeah, so. And I'm looking sure. forward to Adrian coming and speaking specifically to the topic of compost tea and specifically to the topic of compost tea, like a real, really looking forward to his presentation. <laughs> exactly, yeah. We did All a lot of research um, on compost tea and also a lot of practical um, experience from my farm and others, yeah. Yeah. Erwin, do you want and to? So that's how I met Erwin because he was looking for a good composting machine, and that's how my connection to the Netherlands went. <laughs> yeah, great. We are great friends since then, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. So uh, I'm a I'm a biodynamic farmer. Um, I grow mostly uh, biodynamic seeds for different seed co companies uh, here in Holland, the north of Holland, right at the sea level. And uh, I live here with my uh, my wife, five kids, and my father on the farm. We have about uh, two hundred acre acres of farm with uh, without animals. 
Wonderful. And each of them is going to be presenting um, for as, as one of the during one of the weeks. And we've invited all the presenters to be present for this conversation, but they're the only two who showed up. So maybe we'll get more next next week. <laughs> um, all right. I'm just going to pull out a few more questions. We've got 14 still open and one minute left. Until we're supposed to be out of time. Um, does the BF, let me see. Um, Will you be characterizing the practices of the green dots as examples of excellence? Um, that's all entirely available for people to review on the Data Explorer, which is part of what you can find on the um, BioNutrientInstitute.org site. Um, every single sample has got all the management data and environmental conditions connected to it. It's variety, you know, it's everything except for the name of the farmer and the farm that produced it is all there. So it can be teased out. Um, but to the point, it's not the practices per se. Um, is what we found. It doesn't seem to be that specifically. Um, all right. Um, I think we're out of time and the questions keep coming in. So that's great that we uh, ran out of time and we had uh, <laughs> more things to, to engage um, than we had time for. Um, thank you all for attending and we look forward to you being present again next week and for the next 15 weeks. So, so thank you all.